In this lesson, we're going to very quickly review Kepler's laws. Then we're going to meet the astronomical unit. And then we'll look at three examples of typical problems involving Kepler's laws. Let's start by quickly reviewing Kepler's laws as we've already met them in class. Kepler's first law tells us that the planets don't move in circles as used to be believed, but in ellipses. And the sun is not in the middle, it's at one of the focal points. In reality, the ellipses are so close to being circles that it took high quality observation before we were able to tell the difference. Kepler's second law says the planets speed up as they fall closer to the sun and they slow down as they move further away. We already know that on a local scale. If you drop a ball, as gravity pulls it down, it gets faster. If you throw it up against the force of gravity, it slows down. The planets are doing the same thing as they move closer to and further away from the sun. Kepler's third law compares the orbits of two planets. As you will see it on your equation sheet for tests and exams, it looks like this. It tells us that if we take the ratio of the orbital periods of two planets, A and B, and square that number, we're going to get some number. If we then take those two planets' average distances from the Sun and find the cube of that ratio, it will be the same number. Basically, this rule lets us figure out things about the orbit of one planet using data about the orbit of another. We'll see an example in a minute. In this form, it's presented with both periods on the same side of the equation and both distances on the other side of the equation. But we could rearrange that. Let's rearrange it so that we put all the information for one planet on one side of the equation. So that would give us something like this. The distance of planet A cubed divided by the period of planet A squared would be equal to the average distance of planet B from the Sun cubed divided by planet B's period squared. And if you think about what that's saying for a moment, it's saying if we take the distance cubed divided by the period squared for any planet, we're going to get some number. If we take the distance cubed by the period squared for any other planet, we're going to get the same number. In other words, if we take the average distance of any planet from the Sun cubed and divide it by that planet's orbital period squared, we will always get the same number. So you'll often see Kepler's third law written this way, as distance cubed over period squared is a constant known as Kepler's constant for that orbital system. Before we look at some sample problems, let's look briefly at units. The diagram here is some of Galileo's sketches of the phases of Venus. To the naked eye, Venus is just a bright star. But if you look at it through a telescope, you can see its disk shape. And you can see that just like the moon, it goes through phases as it travels around the sun, sometimes we can see most of it lit up, sometimes we can only see part of the lit up side. Now, if you think about that for a minute, that would mean if we looked at Venus when we saw exactly half of it lit up, so here's Venus here, if we're seeing exactly half of Venus lit up, that means that a line drawn from the Earth to Venus and a line drawn from Venus to the sun must be exactly perpendicular to each other. If it wasn't, we would see more or less of the lit up side of Venus. And that would mean a line from Earth to the Sun makes up the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle. Now it's fairly easy to point to where Venus is and to point to where the Sun is at the same time and then measure the angle between them there. Then we can apply some simple trig. The sine of an angle is the side opposite the angle over the hypotenuse. So we measured that angle. The side opposite that angle, that's the distance from Venus to the Sun. And the hypotenuse of that angle, that's the distance from Earth to the Sun. When astronomers did that, measured the angle, found the sine of the angle, they got a value of approximately 0.723. Now think about what that means. That's the sine of the angle. That's Venus's distance from the Sun divided by Earth's distance from the Sun. 
Another way of thinking of that is 0.723 divided by 1. In other words, if we call the distance from Earth to the Sun one unit, then the distance from Venus to the Sun is approximately seven-tenths of that. Although early astronomers couldn't measure distances, they didn't know how far away Earth was from the Sun or how far Venus was from the Sun, with some fairly simple geometry, they were able to figure out that Venus is approximately seven-tenths as far away from the Sun as Earth is. In the same way, they could figure out, figure out the relative distances of other planets from the Sun, just by comparing them to Earth's, which leads us to the astronomical unit. The astronomical unit is defined as the average distance from Earth to the Sun. And it basically comes from that historical way of working out relative distances. If we call the average distance from Earth to the Sun one unit, then we can express the distance of all the other planets in those terms. Venus is approximately 0.72 times as far from the Sun as Earth. Jupiter is just over five times as far away. And we get a set of data like this. You'll be given this data whenever you need it for tests and exams. But even though early astronomers did not know absolute units in kilometers and meters, we do now. The astronomical unit is still a useful one to use. For one thing, it lets us work with pretty small numbers. Earth is about one and one and a half million kilometers away from the sun. And Earth is one of the closer planets to the sun. So if we were going to deal with distances in, in uh, terms of meters and kilometers, we're dealing with really, really big numbers. So often the astronomical unit is just a useful unit to use for distances within the solar system. It let's us work with smaller numbers. Okay, let's look at some practice examples, some sample problems. First problem, Pluto was discovered in 1930. We want to know how long does it take to orbit around the sun? Of course, one way would just be to observe and wait for it to do a full orbit, but as you'll see, that's not really very practical. We can, however, make use of Kepler's laws. We know that Pluto's average distance from the sun is about 39.48 times as far away as Earth, as Earth's average distance. How do we know that? That's actually pretty straightforward. All you have to do is note Pluto's position over a fairly short space of time, and you'll see it moves through a slight little arc. And because we know the orbit is an ellipse, as soon as we've seen a small section of that ellipse, it's pretty easy to calculate what the rest of the orbit must be, look like and the average distances involved. So that's, that's pretty easy to determine fairly quickly. Once we know that, we can use Kepler's laws. So Kepler's third law, we're looking for Pluto's orbital period. So Kepler's third law tells us that the orbital period of Pluto squared divided by the orbital period of some other planet squared will be equal to Pluto's average distance from the sun cubed divided by the average distance from the sun cubed of any other object. So the question is, what other object should we use? Well, it could be anything that's orbiting the sun. We can pick any other planet. We can pick a comet. We can pick an asteroid. We can pick an artificial satellite. As long as it's something that's orbiting the sun and we know its orbital period and we know its average distance from the sun, we can use that. However, if we choose carefully, we can make life a lot easier for ourselves. If we give our distances in standard units of meters and our times in standard units of seconds, we're going to be working with some really big numbers. Uh, you should still be able to solve the problem, but let's pick a little bit more carefully. Instead of using any ob object, let's pick Earth. So Earth's orbital period and Earth's average distance from the sun. And let's think about units. We don't have to use standard units here. These are ratios. It doesn't matter what the unit is. It just matters that we use the same unit for, for both times and the same unit for both distances. So let's make life easy by picking Earth years as our time unit, because the orbital period of Earth then is just one year. And if we pick astronomical units as our distance unit, then Earth's average distance from the sun is just one, one astronomical unit, and our math is going to be a lot easier. Okay, do the algebra first. That's Kepler's law as it's given to you. If we rearrange it to solve for the, or 
orbital period of Pluto, we get something like this. The orbital period of Pluto squared will be its distance from the Sun cubed times Earth's average, uh, that Earth's orbital period squared divided by Earth's distance from the Sun cubed. And so the orbital period of Pluto will be the square root of that. Let's just move up here. Again, I can use any units I want, as long as I use the same units for both periods and both distances. But if I pick carefully, then pick astronomical units as my um, distance unit, then Pluto's average distance from the sun is 39.48 astronomical units. And of course, I have to cube that. And Earth's orbital period is one year, which I have to square, but one squared is one. And uh, Earth's average distance from the Sun is one astronomical unit, and one astronomical unit cubed is one. So basically, my math breaks down to the orbital period of Pluto in years is just going to be the square root of 39.48 cubed. And I'm going to leave it to you to solve the problem. When you do, the approximate answer is somewhere in the vicinity, getting close to 250 years, you can work out the exact value, which gives you an idea of how Kepler's law can be useful. If, the, if we weren't able to work out Pluto's orbital period this way, we would have to wait for over 100 years more before it's completed a full lap of the sun and we know how long it would take. Okay, second problem. We want to know Kepler's constant for the solar system. Notice we're getting into a realm now where solving problems isn't just a matter of plugging numbers into a formula. There are no numbers in this question. You actually have to know what to do. For this one, we need the second way of expressing Kepler's third law. Remember we said one way of putting it is that the average distance cubed of a planet from the sun divided by the square of its orbital period is a constant. That constant is Kepler's constant. So to solve this question, all I have to do is find any object orbiting the sun whose average distance and orbital period I know and plug in the numbers. You should get the same number whichever planet or orbiting satellite you use. Now, of course, we could make it really easier for ourselves, as we did in the last problem, and pick Earth, in which case Earth's average distance from the Sun is one astronomical unit, and its orbital period is one year. And when we do that, we get one cubed divided by one squared, which is one. Of course, it's not one. You have to pay attention to units. It's one AU cubed over year squared. Units matter here. But also that's not really a good solution because since we're dealing with a constant, we should be expressing it in standard units. So this is one where really you can't take that kind of shortcut. You need things in standard units. So what's Earth's average distance from the sun? Well, you can look that up. You'll be given a data table when you need it. Earth's average distance from the sun to two sig figs anyway is 1.5 by 10 to the 11 meters. Then we have to cube that. Earth's orbital period in standard units of seconds, well, we know it's a year, a year, let's just use 365 days for the year, which is an approximation, but it'll serve our purposes now. And there are 24 hours in a day, and there are 3,600 seconds in an hour. And of course, we have to remember to square that. And when you do the math, you get an answer of approximately 3.4 by 10 to the power of 18 meters cubed divided by seconds squared. That's Kempler's constant for the solar system in standard units. Once you see what to do, it's a pretty straightforward problem. Now, theoretically, you should get the same answer if you took data for Mars or Jupiter or Halley's Comet. In practice, if you looked up that data and tried doing it, you might find a small variation in your answer. And that's because the data we're using is approximate. 
Earth is not exactly 1.5 by 10 to the 11 metres away from the sun. That's rounded to two sig figs. A year is not exactly 365 days. It's a little bit longer. So you'll find little rounding errors if you tried to use other planetary data, but you should get an answer very close to that, whichever satellite of the sun you worked with. Okay, final problem. How long does the International Space Station take to complete one orbit around the Earth, given that it orbits at an altitude of about 340 kilometers? As we've seen previously, using Kepler's law, we can rearrange it to tell us that the period of the International Space Station squared is going to be the square root of the orbital radius of the space station cubed, times the period of some other Earth satellite squared divided by that other Earth satellite's orbital radius cubed. So to figure out this information using Kepler's law, we need to know the period and the orbital radius of any other object orbiting the Earth, any artificial satellite, anything. Let's use the Moon, just because I have that data readily available. So our other object is going to be the moon, which is also orbiting the Earth. OK, a couple of things you need to pay attention to. The R is the distance from the Earth to the space station. In practice, what that means is center of mass to center of mass. So the distance we want is the distance from the center of the Earth to the space station. The number we were given in the question was the altitude, the distance above the surface of the Earth. So the R we're looking for in Kepler's law is the distance from the center of the Earth, which will be given on data sheets for tests and things. But the distance from the center of the Earth to the Earth's surface is approximately 6.4 by 10 to the 6 meters. But then we have to add on the additional distance, the altitude above the Earth's surface, and be careful. We're working in standard units, so that 340 kilometers becomes 340,000 meters. That is the orbital radius of the space station. Don't forget it has to be cubed. Then we're going to multiply that by the moon's period. How long does the moon take to orbit the Earth? You can look that up. It'll be given to you on a data sheet for a test. Let's just use 28 days as an approximation. Remember, we don't have to use standard units. We just have to use the same units for equivalent values. And don't forget, that has to be squared. Then we're going to divide that by the moon's average distance from the sun, which you would look up or you'd be given to you on a data sheet. And that is 3.85 by 10 to the 8 meters. And don't forget, that has to be cubed. So the math's getting a little more complicated but now we have everything we need. Now it's just punching buttons on a calculator. Be careful, very easy to make mistakes on complex expressions like that. But you should be getting an answer of approximately 0 0.069. And since we use days as our time unit for the moon's period, this is days as well. Most people wouldn't have much of an idea of what 0 0.069 days is, so it would make sense to put that into more meaningful units. When you convert that to hours, you get an answer of approximately 1.7 hours. In other words, the space station just takes a little over an hour and a half to travel all the way around the Earth. It does approximately 16 or 17 laps of the Earth every day. If you were living on the space station, you'd be seeing 16 or 17 sunrises and sunsets in every 24-hour period. So there you go. There's three example problems of how to work with Kepler's laws. You'll be given some of your own to practice on soon.